This is always uh, very exciting, speaking into a microphone and seeing so many faces. <laughs> I hope I will not uh, mess up everything I say. Um, thank you all for coming and being here. This is uh, our second in-person uh, live Widen the Circle Summer Forum in Berlin. Um, it's still a great thing to know that we don't have to do it virtually um, every time. So um, I'm very glad that we can all be here and that I can look into so many wonderful faces, uh, some familiar, some new, um, some people who are very active um, in the Widen the Circle network or who are friends of Widen the Circle um, in the US, in Germany, and even from France, we have people here. So it is an, a real international uh, community that we have here. And um, yeah, we are just very glad that you came here and um, didn't choose to spend the day at the lake, <laughs> even though it's very nice outside. So yeah, welcome um, to our keynote um, event. And I said that we also have a few new faces or unfamiliar faces here. And for those, I will just take just a few seconds uh, or minutes uh, to talk a little bit about Widen the Circle so you know a little bit better who we are and what this event uh, is, uh, yeah, what the context of this event is. So we, as Widen the Circle, as the organization Widen the Circle, a German, US, or mostly US, German um, organization, we want to help uh, increase the impact um, of people doing local remembrance work, fighting against uh, discrimination and anti-Semitism um, in Germany and also in, in the US. And we do that by different, in different means, by bringing them together, letting them um, share experiencing, experiences and learning from each other, by making them visible um, and yeah, by helping them be encouraged and keep doing this work. This is really our goal. And we have three programs um, by which we are doing or trying to do this. Um, the first is probably our well, most well-known program, the Obermeier Awards. Many of you know them. Some of you are even Obermeier um, Award winners. Um, and the awards have been going on for over 20 years now. And they are um, acknowledging people doing local remembrance and anti-prejudice work here in Germany. And they are really about making, making these people visible, acknowledging them, um, letting other people know about them, because it is important that these people are seen and that it's not only um, like the big organizations that get the, um, the acknowledgement. And the second program is uh, the Wet in the Circle Network, which many of you are also familiar because we also have other events, um, virtual events, um, other in-person events. Um, and with the network, we really want to create a space where people can connect, um, can inspire each other, can find collaborations or start collaborations and learn from each other. Um, and thereby, yeah, helping each other to keep going. And the third program is uh, what we call bridge building, international bridge building. And one of the biggest uh, parts of this program is our yearly visiting program. And we are so happy that we have a group um, of um, educators and activists from the US here now today and also on the stage um, who are part of this visiting program. Um, and because we want to um, also let people learn from uh, other contexts, like um, learn from somebody who works in a completely different environment because this can also help you understand your own situation better and your own approaches. And so the Summer Forum really is a very, very special weekend for us because here we can bring these two groups, the network, uh, the German network and the um, American um, German visiting program together and, and encourage um, yeah, exchange and learning and inspiring each other. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, and when I, um, yeah, so this is the Summer Forum, this is why we are here. When I talk about we are doing that, um, of course I'm talking about the organization and I just want to take a few uh, seconds to thank the people who are involved because this is really a team effort. 
Um, and uh, first of all, I want to thank Joel, now I miss actually, Joel Obermeyer, the executive director of Credit the Deaf, will be always keeping right in the circle, driving its mission and, and thinking forward. And it's really um, a pleasure uh, seeing him, like how he thinks and how he uh, approaches things. And then the second person I want to say a special thanks is Brian Felbush, who's in the back. He's the, uh, maybe the, visiting program wizard. Um, if, you, if, you, if you need like a logistic magician, then uh, Brian is the one. And the third person that I want to say a special thanks to, cannot be here unfortunately, it's uh, Rebecca. She is the heart and soul of Wide and Circle's operations and program uh, managers. She is the director of that. Um, so Rebecca, if you're watching this um, later, you say hi. And we miss you. Um, yeah, and then there are other people, um, of course, who also helped us um, create this this event. Craig, who is doing the recording, Maxime, who is our sound uh, guy, um, Eleni and Ryan, who are our helping hands, and um, and a special thanks also to, to Christine. I don't know where Christine is. Where is Christine? Mm -hmm. Ah, she needs to talk to the restaurant. Christine has been helping me for the last two months, and uh, without her, uh, I would have gone insane. So uh, thanks, Christine, who is outside. Um, yeah. And the last person I want to thank um, is Tamara over there. Uh, she is our translator, and she has translated virtual events for us. And I'm so, so glad, and we are so lucky to have you help us out. Okay, and now I really need to speed up because I'm taking too much time. Um, so this year's um, theme, um, this year's theme of what in the circle is change. And uh, um, tomorrow we will also look at different aspects of change. Tonight we want to um, discuss uh, the a change in narrative. So the um, the topic of this um, of this panel conversation is confronting the past, changing narratives in the U.S. and Germany. Because I think when we think about remembrance work, a lot of uh, about it is about debates, who owns the history, who should be involved in, um, and all this is related to how we talk about remembrance. And so I'm really looking forward to having you guys um, go deeper in in, in that. Um, in that topic. And um, yeah, I just want to very briefly introduce these incredible panelists, which we are very lucky to have. Um, we have uh, Dr. Lisa Bratton, who is an associate professor of history. Um, uh, she is um, researching on the legacy of slavery, but also um, looking into her own um, family history. We have um, Veronica Nam, the director of the Anne Frank Zentrum here in Berlin. Many of you might know the Anne Frank Zentrum. She's an educator and really an expert on historical learning. And, um, uh, and last, the last panelist is uh, Steve Murray, who is the director of the Alabama State Archive, um, which initiated, for example, giving back artifacts to um, um, the indigenous community. So he is also, like, um, yeah, he has an institutional view on, on these debates and narratives um, um, in remembrance work. And last but not least, these are the panelists, but we also have an incredible moderator, Mark Skursky, um, who has been with Facing, has worked for Facing History and House Ourselves, an educational organization in the US, and for um, a few years now has been one of our key supporters to develop our bridge building idea and, um, and mission. And we're incredibly lucky to have you support us and um, thank you for being on our side and also thank you for, um, for yeah, facilitating this session. Um, before I give the microphone to Mark, I just want to say one last thing for those who are listening to the translation. Simultaneous translation is a very exhausting uh, job. Um, and so, um, we will have this, um, this panel talk to each other, and then we will open it up to um, a few questions. Um, I will check in with Tamara, and at some point she might say, I need to stop here, and then uh, I will consecutively um, translate the last two or one or two, three questions that are still open. Just so you know that at some point I might, I might speak again. 
Okay, that's it. Um, I hope you enjoy this conversation and are looking forward to it as much as I am. And I want to give the word uh, and the microphone to Mark. So, just for a few minutes, can I stand? Is that going to mess no, up here? Fine. Okay. So, hello, everybody. And, you know, it's very exciting for me to be here. I've been here for several years. And there are some people I have been in contact with in Germany who are in the room for over 30 years. Um, so when I think about this network and, and sort of, you know, a lot of, Joel, your vision, I think about community and walking into the room and seeing all of you um, is extraordinary. And I'm looking forward to this, but I'm also looking forward to tonight when we can sort of be together and build a community, um, continue building one. So let us begin. Um, but when, we, when I think about community, I think about, well, who's in the room? Um, and so I'm just gonna ask a few questions and then just raise your hand, simple as that. Um, so could you raise your hand if you work in a museum or help to create a museum that explores difficult histories. Look around. Okay, can you raise your hand if you've been involved in the creation of memorials? Okay. Can you raise your hand if you're an educator working with young people if they confront the past? Okay. Can you raise your hand if you have written essays or books that explores aspects of your community's past? It's a pretty amazing group. Raise your hand if you are involved in other forms of historical memory. Okay. And finally, can you raise your hand if you're addressing right-wing extremism, racism, anti-Semitism, or other forms of dehumanization? Yes, you can keep raising your hands. So, I mean, look around, and so we will be having a panel conversation, but the conversation is really gonna be happening at dinner, uh, because all of us are sort of involved with this kind of work. So, let us begin our conversation. Um, so, for over four decades, I've observed and been part of conversation about how evolving historical narratives have been developed and taught in the United States and Germany. And it's clear that many of you in the audience have been instrumental in helping to shape these narratives on a local and national level. In today's discussion with Lisa and Veronica and, and Steve, um, should illuminate many of the issues related to confronting history in 2023. The differences and similarities in the United States and in Germany and some of the challenges that we face now and into the future. So, and I am gonna read this part. Some of the questions we'll explore during our time together is how and why do narratives change with each generation? How does new research help shape narratives? And how does it become part of the public narrative? How does demogra demographics of a town, city, or country influence how narratives are constructed. What effect can the political landscape have on which stories are told and which are banned? Whose voices should be woven into the stories of collective violence and genocide? Should be people who are uh, victimized or bystander or perpetrators? Who should be making the decisions about the various ways history is told through public curriculum, public monuments, museums, and memory sites? And how can truth telling be used as a way or a process for healing? Hopefully we'll have some time to explore these questions now, but hopefully it will also stimulate further conversations for tonight and into tomorrow. So I'm gonna turn now to this and we're gonna have a conversation. Um, and we're gonna start with you, Lisa. Um, I assume many of the people in this room know something about what's happening in the United States um, in the present political climate. And I know this is a challenging question for you because we don't have a lot of time, but could you talk briefly about 
how politics is impacting historical memory in the United States as it relates to confronting the history of slavery and racism in our country. Thank you, Mark. Um, my mic on? Okay, great. Um, and yes, that is a big question. It usually takes me an entire school year to answer that question, but I'm gonna do my best in the few minutes that I do have. Um, politics, you asked about politics. Politics is entwined with economics and history and cannot be divorced um, in the way that we teach and in the way that we think. Um, it affects the flow of money in certain groups, out of certain groups, and which groups are, and, and, and it informs us about which groups are eliminated from that flow of money. So, um, but with respect to the teaching of African American history, I never start African American history at the point of our enslavement, 1619, or more um, accurately, 1444, when the first Africans were taken to Lisbon, Portugal, for the purpose of enslavement. So I never start there. I always have to acknowledge Africa, even if I acknowledge Africa in one sentence, which I will do now, but um, we have to look first at the foundations of African civilizations, which were uh, Mali, Songhai, ancient Kemet, or Egypt is uh, what we call it uh, here. Um, but we have to acknowledge those nations that were strong and that conducted international commerce. We can't start in 1619 um, when we were first enslaved. So our experience of enslavement, as I mentioned, started in 1444 and ended in 1888 when enslavement was abolished in the country of Brazil. So our enslavement was throughout the East Coast, even in the North of the United States. But they ended it early because it wasn't commercially viable. They weren't making any money. So they ended it. It was not out of love for black people. Um, so our enslavement also lasted through the country, of, the continent of South America and throughout the Caribbean even into parts of Europe and Asia. So the aftermath of over 400 years of enslavement has been a deliberate erasure of our history, the criminalization of our skin, the denial of our civil and human rights, and exploitation of our economic independence. But the news is not all bad, because in spite of the denigration of our African past, we have maintained a lot of our cultural heritage. We uh, experience the veneration or the respect for our ancestors. Uh, we have a strong sense of, sense of uh, spirituality, and we are just a resilient people. So um, another aspect of the political environment were the many, many laws that were designed to keep us socially, educationally, economically, and politically oppressed. After enslavement was abolished, by the 13th Amendment, not the Emancipation Proclamation, but the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, there was an era called Reconstruction. So this was a time when we saw really a lot of gains um, politically, with a, a record number of politically uh, of elected officials to Congress. So you can probably guess what happened next, but I'll put it in the words of, of um, uh, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, who lived in Berlin, for a while, but I think he said it best. And he said, the Negro went free, stood for a moment in the sun, and went right back into slavery. Mm. So after Reconstruction, we experienced the denial of our voting rights, Jim Crow, which is segregation, black codes, which were laws that really put us a half a step above slavery, and, um, but they were designed to place us as close to enslavement as possible. But even in the midst of institutions put in place to oppress us, we created. And we created the Harlem Renaissance, which was a literary and artistic movement that taught the world about our creativity. We instituted the Civil Rights Movement, where the famous and the unsung fought not only for civil rights, but human rights. So we loved ourselves into the Black is Beautiful consciousness, we created Black History Month because Negro History Week was not enough to commemorate all of our contributions to America and to the world. We organized the Tuskegee Airmen during World War II when the United States had two militaries, one black and one white. We elected the first African-American president, Barack Obama, 
And as my students at Tuskegee University would say, we did that. <laughs> to you. So, how does our very, very complicated history in America affect memorials and memory work? So for decades, our accomplishments went largely ignored in terms of monuments and memorials. And our, uh, organ our government body that uh, 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 gives, uh, that creates um, monuments is the National Park Service. So the first African-American monument was dedicated to Dr. George Washington Carver, who did much more than work with the peanut. He was working on a cure for polio when he passed away in 1943. But a few months after Dr. Carver died, um, we, there was a, a national park created in his honor. And since then, the number and the frequency of national parks de uh, dedicated to the African American experience have greatly increased. All right, so fast forward to 2023. The National Park Service honestly has gotten the message that our stories matter. We have dozens of sites that memorialize and commemorate African American history from the national level and hundreds on the state, county, and local levels. But there's still the issue of politics, and it's always challenging. But when the political environment becomes a hindrance, grassroots organizers persist. So sometimes it's a marker, sometimes it's a traveling exhibit, sometimes it's a museum built in someone's home. But there are, and, and, and those matter, those places matter. Um, there are dozens of former plantations standing, including several that were uh, that dedicated to the life and legacy of US presidents who held African Americans in bondage, including George Washington, and Thomas Jefferson. So some of these sites are problematic based on interpretation. So for example, um, the, the, the narrative that uh, Thomas Jefferson was in his 40s and Sally Hemings, who was 15, that they were in love. And I was at Monticello probably two years ago. And that's a story that they told us, this love story. So I raised my hand, okay, well, we won't go into that. But um, other, other sites are problematic with their placement. And so my, uh, for example, I'm gonna be talking more about my maternal <coughs> side with Historic Bradsville, but my maternal side um, was uh, enslaved at Fort Hill Plantation, which is on the campus of Clemson University. It's the former plantation of John C. Calhoun, who was the seventh vice president of the United States. So what, his family home is right in the middle of the Clemson University campus. And for people perhaps who had not heard of Clemson, it's a very popular and very large university in South Carolina. And the graves of hundreds of formerly enslaved African Americans are right next to the stadium where the Clemson Tigers play their football games. And it's one of those, you know, cost traffic on the street for, you know, traffic on the highway for miles is a very popular game. So the people who go there to party before and after the game walk right by the sacred space of formerly enslaved African Americans, but they are not paying any attention. There are signs up that say, please respect this space. This is a, a cemetery, but no one is paying attention. And then thousands of people are walking past Fort Hill Plantation, like I said, which is right in the center of campus, and no one is paying attention. But the University of Virginia has gotten it right. So they have a, an amazing uh, monument to enslaved ancestors. It's very symbolic, and it embraces African and African American traditions. And it helps visitors see these hundreds of people who built the University of Virginia, brick by brick, helps us to see them as humans. So the memory work continues. The pain of the centuries in America is brought to the fore with commemorations throughout the nation. The work is not done as we uncover more of our history and activists like those of you in the room who raised your hands uh, in telling of our rich and diverse history. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I'm going to turn to Steve, and 
you know, Lisa, what I really appreciate about what you just did is there is so much negativity in the United States, and there's also unbelievable positive movement uh, of grassroots people who are doing this important work, including you. Um, but I do want to turn to Steve just to talk for a bit about what the backlash is in the United States to some of these efforts, and particularly maybe some of the politicization that's going on in the schools where I think many of you probably know that what Lisa is talking about, um, the history of, of slavery in some states can't even be taught right now. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure, thank you, and it's uh, such an honor to be here with all of you uh, this afternoon. Uh, I think American society right now is in a place where uh, we've created a fertile field for, for division, and part of that is because we have had some breakdown in traditional civic institutions that had pre in previous decades created civic spaces where healthy, productive conversations could take place. Fewer Americans belong to organizations today than they have historically. Uh, participation in organizations and churches and synagogues is down, and so there are fewer spaces where people have conversations about these issues and increasingly rely on media and social media to get their, to gain their understanding of what's happening in the world and what matters and how that might affect their interest as people. And in that kind of environment, we have uh, certain people who are acting intentionally to sow discord and disagreement over uh, the good things that are happening across public history institutions and, and educational uh, contexts. Uh, and a journalist named Amanda Ripley uh, wrote a book that I recommend called High Conflict. And she talks about these individuals as being conflict entrepreneurs, people who are intentionally and gainfully uh, sowing discord out into the political environment in order to try to set one group of Americans against another. And unfortunately, that is succeeding. Uh, and one consequence of that is that we see increasingly language in media and social media that sets uh, groups against each other and creates an anxiety that uh, has appeared before in the past. We've had what we've referred to as the history wars uh, in, in America in the late 20th century. These come around kind of cyclically, uh, but currently we're in a moment of really high conflict over notions of what uh, history is and what it isn't, how it should be taught and shared with our young people, and it's being conflated with issues related to sexuality and gender identity in a way that um, is feeding an anxiety that organizations like schools and museums and other um, institutions are promoting an agenda that is harmful to our young people especially. And that uh, tends to ratchet up the temperature and political dialogue very quickly. And what you see as a result are attempts through legislation to uh, limit what educators are able to address in the classroom uh, at both the kindergarten through 12th grade level as well as in higher education in a way that is really threatening to the process of free inquiry in a, in a, in a free society, it's something that is um, terribly counterproductive to the work that organizations like Wide and Circle and other uh, allies are trying to do. So, so let, let's stay with you for a minute. Um, you're the director of a state run institution in one of the most conservative states in the country um, is the Alabama Department of, um, of um, Archives and History. And in 2020, your institution wrote a public statement of recommitment to your mission as the archives for the state and emphasized that historically the archive was a major contributor to the intellectual underpinnings of systemic racism from the turn of the 20th century until the time of the centennial of the, seniors of the Civil War, and that the legacies of those contributions linger, linger with us still. Um, so in this panel, we're talking about 
sort of changing historical narratives. Can you talk just a bit about the institution, how the in institution started as a way of preserving the Confederacy history, Confederate history, and how it's evolved, and what are some of the major challenges you face in the present political climate that Lisa you know, outlined and that you just spoke about? Sure, let me touch on uh, something that Lisa mentioned as, as a, a preface to that. And, and uh, going back to the end of the Civil War in 1865, four million enslaved African Americans gained their freedom. And that, as Lisa mentioned, begins a process that we call Reconstruction that lasted about 10 years. And during that 10 years, African Americans uh, gained a tremendous uh, progress in terms of their rights as individuals and as citizens. They, in addition to slavery being abolished formally, African Americans gained their citizenship and African American men acquired the vote. And it was uh, revolutionary in terms of the nature of our democracy and a major step forward in realizing the lofty, ambitious language in our nation's founding uh, about a century before that. But Reconstruction did not last. Uh, after about a decade, there were efforts to suspend that period of progress that was happening. And it happened for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, Congress, frankly, got tired of dealing with the South and turned its attention elsewhere. And as a result of that, the uh, those who had had political power prior to the Civil War were able to regain control of our public institutions in the mid 1870s. And they immediately began rolling back some of those changes that had been made during Reconstruction. That culminates in a movement in the 1890s until around the turn of the 20th century to then formally rescind the uh, suffrage rights that African Americans had gained during that time. And so you went from a, uh, uh, a functioning, um, well, I don't, know, don't want to overstate that, a, a nominally functioning democracy to one where there was a very small elite group of people who controlled government. And that happened in Alabama in 1901 and actually created white supremacy as the official policy of state government. And they achieved that by disenfranchising African Americans. The creation of our agency also occurred in 1901. It was not inherently tied to that constitutional convention, but the coincidence has some significance because when our agency was created, it was out of a desire to do a couple of things. One was a very necessary and appropriate step forward to take better care of the official government records of Alabama, something that we continue to do today. The second cause was to collect and preserve materials that document the Confederate experience, the experience of those Southerners who uh, seceded from the Union in 1861 and then fought a war to preserve the institution of slavery. That was uh, uh, done in part to provide documentation for pensions for Confederate veterans and, the, and their widows, uh, but it set in place a series of values and a mission for our institution that performed historical work in a very discriminatory way. We immediately, in addition to acquiring official government records from the very beginning, we acquired materials from the general public. So we're also like a special collections library at a university in that respect. And our agency uh, began doing that very actively to document the history, the lives, the contributions of white Alabamians, but not doing anything remotely similar to document the lives and contributions of black Alabamians. And being just a quarter of a century away from Reconstruction and a little further from emancipation, there were extraordinary things happening as black people embraced freedom and built their own cultural organizations. But the history of those efforts and during those years were not preserved with the same effort as that of white society. And that created a tremendous deficit in the historical record that can never be erased. Because once those records are lost, they're lost. And what that means is that generations of historians have not had the benefit of some records that would have existed otherwise. African-American families would not have access to genealogical information that they might have had otherwise if we had had an equitable approach to pursuing historical work during those years. 
Fast forward to 2020, after the murder of George Floyd, our institution was, uh, like everyone, uh, reflecting on what that meant for us as an organization and how we could be of service to a community that nationally, I think it's fair to say, was asking questions about our nation's history of racial injustice at a degree that had, I'd certainly never seen in my lifetime and I don't think it ever occurred before. We as an institution knew that we had resources created in, in more recent history to help understand that. We have spent the last uh, three decades creating recordings of public programming, uh, acquiring records that we could, producing exhibitions that helped to tell the story of uh, race in Alabama. And, but before we could share that and, and a desire to be helpful during this moment of painful reflection, we knew that uh, we could not do that in any appropriate way uh, without acknowledging our own role in creating the systemic racism that Americans were discussing at the time. So the statement acknowledged the existence of systemic racism and described our institution's own role in creating the very conditions that were not directly uh, responsible for what was happening in 2020, but had certainly contributed to the overall environment of discrimination that has existed in our country. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> we'll get back to some of this, um, but I do want to turn to Veronica. Um, so Veronica, you've worked um, at the Anne Frank Center for uh, 20 years, um, and this is your second year as a director. Uh, while many um, people visit your center, your main audience is young people. And when you think back on your own schooling and your professional work over the last two decades um, addressing the Holocaust with students, how have you seen narrative change? How is the story told in terms of not only the content, but methodology? So, you know, some people here, you know, are, who live here in Germany might know this, but we're talking about sort of an arc of narrative creation. So could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, thank you, Mark, and uh, thank you for you, the both of you. I learned already a lot, and I try to contribute something. Yeah, how um, did we, how did narratives change? How did we change our work for, also for example, uh, as the Anne Frank Centrum? Um, first, what did we not change? We exist since almost 30 years, and we, we have been working for all the time with the concept, the pedagogic concept of peer education. And um, also, I, I will explain this uh, in, a, in a second, but also we do not only work on the question, who was Anne Frank, what was the history of the Holocaust, but also we always ask, what does her story have to do with today and how can we get involved in democracy and freedom so in the sense of uh, also yeah, the thoughts and the goals of Anne Frank what can we contribute to a more um, democratic society with less um, anti-semitism anti and other forms of discrimination today the uh, peer education concept is um, that means we work with exhibitions. So these are places to get people into conversations. And these are um, yeah, places where you can learn more about the subject, but where you can come into contact. And um, we train young people to do guided tours through these exhibitions. And um, yeah, these uh, young people um, they find their own narratives on the story. And I um, often experience that there is a connection between uh, the focus of their stories and their previous experiences and also their underlying values. So every new peer guide tells slightly another story. And um, on the other side, the narratives change with each group, of course, because the first step is to ask the youngsters, the youngsters, 
what are you interested in and what do you already know about the story and this is the starting point and so um, then again the questions change um, when the, the politics and the situations change so for example in uh, 2015 when many people from Syria were seeking protection in Germany the young people realized that Anne Frank was a refugee too and that and then they asked questions about uh, the arrival of the family Frank in the Netherlands how did they find a home and how did the parents find work and how did they learn the new language and things like this so this uh, biographical approach always um, works in um, comparison between my own situation and the situation of this person in history I meet and um, then you find out similarities and differences but um, it's not that you talk about facts and figures of history but you talk about people in history and um, yeah so there are things that change and things that are the same but perhaps one thing that we change when, when I um, compare the exhibition we showed 30 years ago and the exhibition we show now, uh, an important thing is that we try to tell the story now for everyone. So uh, we try to tell it more exclusively <laughs> and inclusively. And um, for example, we also want to tell it for blind people and deaf people and people with learning difficulties. We do this out of a human rights oriented attitude. If we talk about a time when people were made, were made differently, then we should take the principles of democracy very seriously and we, yeah, of course, all people have equal rights and everyone has the right to have the opportunity to come to our learning um, environment, to our exhibition. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Um, so I want to go back to you, Lisa, um, because it sort of builds off a little bit of what you were talking about. Um, you know, Lisa's a, um, you're a historian, and you've done a, an extensive research on the Tuskegee airmen, you know, doing over 250 or 300 interviews, um, but you also have done something on a very personal level. Um, so for years you've been, it sounds like over 20 years, 25 years, um, you've been researching the plantation where your family, family members were enslaved in, in South Carolina. Um, can you talk a bit about the plantation, how the narrative of this particular site, historic Brattonsville, was crafted for the public, and how since your initial interest in doing research, the narratives has changed, how they tell the story. Um, so let's start there, and then I'm gonna follow it up with some of the more recent things that have happened to you. Okay, all right, um, thank you. So historic Bratsville is about 800 acres in South Carolina. It is um, the only working plantation in South Carolina, and what I mean by that is that all of the technology, the, whatever that we use on the plantation is, uh, was, was de developed in a, around 1850. So we don't use any kind of modern technology. So we, um, they do farming, they have animals, and it's designed to be just like it looked in 1850. And so um, first time I went to Bradsville, I was very young, I was about six. And um, my parents took us, we, I'm from Vallejo, California, and my parents took us there one summer. We used to go almost every summer or at Christmas. And so they, uh, we went, and so my father took us to this place called Bradsville, and I said to myself, wow, we're rich. <laughs> because all these big giant buildings have Bratton on them. So to me, that's great. But no one ever said to me, I maybe they thought I was too young, really, I guess I was, to understand, mm -mm, no, your family was enslaved here. But um, so as I got a little older, maybe into middle school, I thought that if you just, black people, if you drive around the South long enough, you will find your plantation. And so Brandsville couldn't be all that impressive because everybody has one. 
But you know, for, for people who may not understand really the context of enslavement, I will tell you that um, I'm the only person I know who can go back to their plantation standing. I'm not counting my other friends and colleagues who do this kind of work on their own plantations, but I'm the only person I know who has a plantation they can go back to. I'm definitely the only person I know who can go back to a plantation on two sides of the family. My mother's side, as I mentioned, at Clemson, and my father's side at Bradensville. And I know for a fact I must be the only black person in America that has those two distinctions, and also at Bradensville, 150 years of plantation records that have survived that are at the University of South Carolina, and all of the documentation that is available on John C. Calhoun since he was a, the seventh vice president of the United States. So I'm a very, very, very rare person. And I will just say this to me, I can't not do this work because I look, I said, well, Lisa, how dare you? How dare you have all of this knowledge and the ability to read and write that Green and Melinda Bratton, my great great grandparents, who did not have, and you have a PhD in African American Studies? How would you, how could you not do this work? So this work is is truly my passion. So I've been working at volunteering at Brattonsville, and you know sometimes they pay me a little bit, but um, I've been working there for a, for a very long time. But in the very beginning, let's say around 1970s and 80s we would get these flyers in the mail that would say, come to Brattonsville and learn all about the architecture or learn about how wonderful Colonel Bratton was, who was an American Revolutionary War hero. Come on, okay, we're not going to that. My family was completely uninterested, and so we never went to any of their events until in 2003 we got an invitation to come and meet the white Brattons, the, the white descendants. And so I went to that, but I told them I'm not going by myself. Everybody's going with me to this. So we all, you know, a lot of them came and we did have a chance to meet the White Bradleys, but the, con the uh, conversation was very sterile. Uh, past the salt, nice weather we're having. So um, I'll get into that when we, uh, how the second part of this came to be. So now Bradsville really interprets African American history really in. I give them an A minus. They really are doing a good job. Um, for the longest, there was a um, there was a long story, but the short version is uh, Rufus Bratton brought the KKK to South Carolina, and um, for a long time you could talk about Rufus Bratton on the plantation. You ask a question, they say I raise my hand, of course, ask the question once. They said, well, let's talk about that later. You just say the KKK to this group because it, the context. Thank you. The Ku Klux Klan um, was founded right after the 13th Amendment, and it was a group designed to terrorize and inflict additional oppression on black communities. And um, yeah, and they did, and they were very active, and they're still active. Um, but they were very active. Uh, you know, if a black person got too prosperous, then the KKK might visit at, at night, and they sometimes call them night riders. But thank you. I did need to make that clarification. So Rufus Bratton was the person who brought the Ku Klux Klan to uh, South Carolina. It was founded in Pulaski, Tennessee, but he was the one uh, responsible for bringing it to South Carolina. So um, for a long time, like I said, you couldn't mention his name, but now, oh, I'm very proud of this. Brattonsville, about a year ago, put up a historic marker that tells the story of Rufus Bratton and the lynching that he was responsible for in uh, 1871, they lynched a, a member of the black militia. And militias were legal. Black militias were legal during Reconstruction. Um, and so now people tell the story of Rufus Bratton. And um, when for a long time they didn't and would try to divert your attention to the architecture or to how wonderful Colonel Bratton was. But now they, they really have come a very, very long way. And the beautiful part is that they often, almost always, consult the descendants and the black descendants and um, until we, anyway, I'll tell that part later. But, um, so yeah, yeah. So, you found your white relatives. So I, I need to just, just talk about it. Okay. <sighs> so, um, for a couple of years, I asked the people at Bradsville, the management and staff, to connect me with the white Bradley descendants. I just wanted to meet them. I just wanted to have a conversation. Let's just talk about this shared history. So a couple of them I knew, but they said, um, well, uh, 
we don't really want to do a conversation. We don't know how it's going to turn out. And we don't, I said, look, I'm not interested in name calling, placing blame, cussing and fussing, I, or, you know, being ugly, I should say. I'm not interested in that. I said, I'm interested in the conversation. So we started having conversations on Zoom in uh, 2022. So during that time, one of the descendants, a white descendant said she had some documents of Rufus that belonged to Rufus Bradley and I want to see them. <laughs> of course. So I get in the car, driving her, the next week, I was in my car, I drove to Greenville, South Carolina, she had these documents. And long story short, we, um, she had had her DNA tested. And she pulled it up, and there's Lisa Bradley as a blood relation to them. Now I had tested other people. Her first cousin is a congressman, politician from the area. He'd been to our family reunion. I got to tell right. He came to our family reunion in 2004, sitting congressman, the politician in the United States. And I'm introducing him as Congressman John Spratt. He's walking around my whole family reunion, the only white man there. <laughs> Say, hi, cousin. Hi, cousin. Hi, cousin. I said, OK, I'm going to act like this is normal. And this is our cousin, John Spratt. But it turns out that so he and I did DNA. He, was, he and I were not a match. But I was a match with his first cousin, Nancy. And so that's how we found out that I am, in fact, blood related to them. Now, let me be clear. Because I have had black people in the United States say to me, well, of course you're related to them. Look how light you are. OK, stop right there. Because the way that black women's bodies were devalued during enslavement, my great grand, the white person in my family could have been some white man riding by on a horse, some 15 year old trying to figure it out. It could have been anybody. And so I have to say, just because I look the way I look does not mean that I am blood related to the white Bradley, but it just happens that I am. And so now we are working together. We, um, our first project now, what we're working on, is restoring the slave cemetery that has been neglected at Brattonsville since slavery. So we got Brattonsville to build a huge fence around it, which was very expensive, but they kind of do what we asked them to do most of the time. And so, um, and now we, we travel together. I just had lunch with one of them last month when I was in her city. And it, it's actually been a very, very positive experience for me um, not being a person who has a lot of white friends, not really, I'll just put it out there, not really any white friends. But um, we become friends and we become family. And we are, um, we're, we're going to Ireland together because that's where the white brands are fun. So we're trying to plan a trip to Ireland. But um, there's just there's so many layers to this. But the most beautiful part is, is that we always talk about how much we appreciate the relationship that we have with each other. And they tell me that all the time, and I say the same to them. Uh, but this is new for me. All oh, this is very new, and I'm still processing it. Don't have it all figured out yet, and that's OK. Um, but it's been good for me as a human being to have this experience with them. Thank you. Um, you know, Steve, uh, that was powerful. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where to put that. <laughs> but we'll talk later. Yeah. Um, so Lisa just brought, talked about historic Brattonsville and, and the sort of the, the narrative change that's going to be changing and how it changes, we don't know. I mean, that's going to be on a personal level, but who knows in terms of public narrative how that plays out in terms of the history, not the history of your family, but how deep you can dig into that history with this, your white descendants. Um, but you have in your museum some interesting things happening right now. Um, you have been changing the narrative about how African American history is taught and how you're curating um, in a very different way. Your whole museum has been taken apart um, a while ago, and it's now going to be taken apart again to sort of reconstruct, um, you know, the, the narrative. Um, but there's one thing I would like you to talk about is you had an extensive collection um, because there were a lot of Native American tribes on, you know, throughout Alabama uh, that were torn apart 
sent off their lands, and you had a huge collection of artifacts, yet something has happened in your museum about this, and this is about artifacts now in terms of narrative. Can you talk about that? Sure, and, and um, there's a federal law in the United States called the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. It was actually enacted in 1990, so this law has been on the books for, for quite a while now. And many museums across the country are in the position that we are. We are, we are at one level, merely complying with federal law and what we're doing. But I think what's been a little bit different about the way we're approaching that work is that we have said we are embracing not only the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law. And in 2018, when our agency concluded that we were not in compliance with this federal law, our board of trustees adopted a seven part statement of desired outcomes that said, uh, first of all, we're going to comply fully with the letter of the law, but it went on to say that we're gonna do this in a transparent way. We're gonna do it in a way that builds trust with Native American um, uh, tribal nations and, and creates a long-standing relationship with them, or that that would be our desire anyway. And then also that we would be a resource for other institutions in Alabama that might have their own collections that uh, are subject to MAGPRA and subject to repatriation. So what, what the law requires is that any museum that has uh, funerary objects, so these are artifacts removed from Native American burials or ancestral remains, human remains of Native Americans, in their collections to work with the tribal nation and determine which tribe that exists today would be a federal, an appropriate uh, recipient for the repatriation of those materials. So Alabama has a rich Native American heritage that goes back 14,000 years. And we have been working with uh, 18 federally recognized tribes who have some type of connection historically to the state and examining this very large collection that's over 400,000 items. Uh, 400,000. A little over 100 uh, sets of human remains that came into our collections about a century ago. This was activity that was happening all across the United States at the time when anthropology was still a, an emerging profession, not just in the US, but around the world. And they believed that they were conducting excavations in the interest of human knowledge and believed that they were uh, appropriately excavating burials in Alabama and putting those materials in a museum so that they could advance our understanding of that past. We know today that that was an inappropriate and insensitive and unethical um, thing to do. None of us would want our ancestors' places of rest disturbed. And so uh, we uh, had used some of those artifacts on display for many decades, had treated them in a, in a manner that was respectful and, and to tell stories that actually helped to promote understanding of Native American history. But what's new for us now is an, is an understanding that we can do that without those types of materials. And we do that by working with the Native American community, by building partnerships and including them in our exhibit design process and providing spaces for their voices to be experienced by our visitors at our museum. Uh, our goal is to create an institution where all Alabamians or descendants of former Alabamians who have a history there feel that their history is respected and represented in our institution when they walk in the door. So you'll be returning all of those artifacts throughout the country? Well, we're, yes, yeah, so we're in the, uh, at the conclusion of an initial phase of that that affects about uh, 4,000 artifacts and all of the uh, human remains that are in the process of being returned to Native American tribes. There's a longer process that will affect a larger number of those materials that will actually extend probably years into the future. So Veronica, <laughs> um, you know, we've been the group of the visiting program you know, from the States and from Germany, and we've been in dialogue. And I think the perspective from most of us from the States is that Germany has done quite an amazing job of sort of confronting the past. And I know there's still questions about that as it relates to the Holocaust. Um, but could you talk about Germany's colonial past and uh, what's happening in Germany as it relates to confronting that part of your history? Yeah. 
Um, first of all, I wanted uh, shortly to connect to what you said, uh, primarily about changing exhibitions, um, because uh, it's, it's another point, but it goes in the same directions. Um, I, I wanted um, to give you an example what we changed in our new exhibition um, because we wanted to tell the story in an anti-Semitic, critical way. Um, that means, for example, that we decided um, to not to show anti-Semitic Nazi propaganda anymore. In the old exhibition, for example, there was an election poster of the NSDAP with an anti-Semitic illustration. And of course, we used the object in the old exhibition to tell uh, the youngsters um, about the fact that anti-Semitism was an important part of Nazi ideology and uh, we described that this um, um, picture describes anti-Semites and not Jews but um, we found out that or we had uh, the fear that uh, nevertheless we tell them the critical um, context they learn anti-Semitic pictures and um, so we decided to, um, um, to, to show anti-Semitic violence in the new exhibition through a collection of a Jewish NGO that uh, collected anti-Semitic incidents in the 1920s and 30s and now one can read about an anti-Semitic incident in Frankfurt where the Frank family lived and uh, one can imagine what impression this case made on the family and um, in addition one learns something about the Jewish civil society at that time that tried to defend itself against anti-Semitism. So um, it's very important to, to tell the history in a multi-perspective way but to avoid to give um, the perpetrators and the, the propaganda uh, a big um, screen and a big uh, screening. <laughs> yeah, I think that, um, of course, it's very important that uh, the colonial past in Germany find its way more into the culture of remembrance. Um, I myself attended courses on colonial history and the process of decolonialization during my studies at Humboldt University 30 years ago. So it's not that there hasn't been work on the subject um, of uh, the colonial past of Germany at university level, but in the culture of remembrance and in schools, colonial crimes have hardly played a role so far. And I think it's good that things are on their way to change. Um, but there is one thing that um, is sometimes voiced, uh, namely that the remembrance of the Holocaust has, uh, so that there was this, in a way too much remembrance on the Holocaust and that because of this there is less remembrance on colonial crimes and I think this connection is not correct. The reason why it's not so much part of the culture of remembrance I think the reasons are very complex, but I think that um, the history of the Second World War and the history of the Holocaust was very present after 1945 and um, that there were not enough, um, yeah, it was like that there, it was not a seeable, um, uh, it, it was a very big subject and other very important subject were not that much uh, worked on. They were not uh, asked questions about. And yeah, and I think it, it makes absolutely no sense that we imagine the remembrance culture as a cake or something, and that if there is a big piece of cake, then there is a little, no, only a little piece of cake left or something like this. I think that um, history is there to better understanding the present and um, colonial crimes are, if we do not know about colonial crimes, we cannot understand 
um, the history of racism, for example, in Germany, and other important um, questions um, in the present. So we have to go on. Mm. Thank you. So this is a question I can imagine um, a lot of the people in the audience have been thinking about in their own lives. Um, and the three of you have been spent decades, you know, studying very cruel and violent histories. Um, and I have a question if you want to answer this. Um, I certainly, you know, this happened to me. It's like I, at times I felt numb. At times I felt traumatized. Um, and how, how do you manage sort of being in those archives and touching those documents or, or being on the plantation where you know more and more what happened to your family? Um, but Veronica, the, the, the history of this, this nation and, and, and the brutality, you know, it, it's not that long ago produced. Um, anyone? Um, yes, I can respond. Um, for the decades that I've been doing this work, it was very, I felt very empowered by it because Green and Melinda Bratton were enslaved at Brattonsville. We have the document that shows when they purchased Melinda Bratton, she was 14 years old. I've also seen her name in, uh, listed as the marital property. She's in a prenuptial agreement. Uh, uh, agreement that people sign before they get married so that in the case they get divorced, this is what's going to happen to the property. So she's listed in Mary Caroline Bratton's prenuptial agreement as her marital property. And so um, I've seen that. I've seen the contract that my great-great-grandfather signed when he was freed on the plantation. And there are tons of documents um, about the both of them. And I just felt empowered by it. They were the first freedmen to purchase land in York County. So I said, okay, well, we come from enslavement, but we also come from a strong tradition of land ownership and real estate, which was my father's business and, and is mine now. And I was fine with it. I, I can handle this is empowering to me. So um, about two months ago, I went with a group of uh, other professors, academics, to James Highland's plantation in um, Virginia. I had been there before. And we sat there and we were together watching a, a video about his plantation. And I just had a, a moment. And I'm not related to James Monroe, uh, but it was a feeling that I hadn't felt before. Just all of the, I don't know if it was all of that Brattonsville, you know, uh, I don't know, because I get up every morning at six with my writing group and we write together from six to eight. So this is what I do, right? But it was something about that video that I saw that took me to a place that I have not been in the 30 years I've been working at Brattonsville. So still trying to figure out exactly what happened. But, um, for a long time, for the longest, I just felt empowered by my work. I love my work. Um, when I go to South Carolina to where the Bratton family papers are, it's like the best day ever. And I go to the archive and I get there when they open and I leave when they close. And I can do that for days at a time. And um, so I, I, I don't know, I'm still trying to figure that out, but I still do say that this is um, the most important work that I do because it is um, empowering and the, what I'm writing about is the ways that African people are on the plantation resisted enslavement. Because there have been so many books written about, oh, slavery did this, slavery did that, which it did. I'm not um, belittling that. But there were also ways that people took what little they had and they resisted. And that's the beauty of the African spirit is that we are, 
I, I represent the strongest of the strong because everybody didn't make it out of Africa, not that they wanted to go. Everybody didn't survive the Middle Passage, that uh, ship months long voyage from Africa might have stopped several times in South America and the Caribbean before you get to um, South Carolina, Charleston, which is where most African Americans came through that particular port in Charleston, South Carolina. So everybody didn't make that. Everybody didn't make survive that harsh life on the plantation. But when I look at myself, I say, well, I'm the strongest of the strong, so it's always been empowering to me, and it still is, and it's the most important work I do. Oh, uh, thank you, Lisa, and I, I would add, um, it, it can be frustrating and it can be draining. Uh, I find encouragement in, in two places. One is in a community of peers. I think that anyone who's engaged in remembrance work or in um, this area of work that we do, it's, it's vital to have networks of people who understand the work you're doing and who, with whom you can have conversations. And uh, we're here to lift each other up, and we all need that encouragement from time to time, and that's a vital part of the network's like widening the circle. The second is just the inspiration that I draw from the people whom we are studying and watching in history. The, the, the resilience of the human spirit and the ability to uh, overcome uh, extraordinarily difficult uh, experiences in, in their lives and still to find a way forward and a day to walk in, a way to walk into the next day. We've been talking some uh, this week about the experiences of Jewish people um, at the end of the war, you know, in the story that not enough of us know about displaced persons in Europe and what it took for them to uh, start to rebuild a life uh, after the Holocaust. Uh, the persistence of people who face a loss in the civil rights movement and decide still to get up the next day and to continue that struggle. John Lewis in particular, uh, who wound up being a U.S. congressman but was a very young man when he became a leader in the civil rights movement, had his skull fractured multiple times. I've never met a person who embodied such uh, raw courage and sweetness of spirit in the same individual. Just an extraordinary person. And I think that we can all look at people like that. And Frank, you know, so many of them that encourage us to get up and the least we can do is keep trying uh, while taking care of ourselves along the way because we need to do that too. I can connect very much to that what you said and uh, I want to add that um, the very cruel things the Holocaust, they just took part and they existed and they exist still. And if we do not look into this uh, history and if we try to avoid and try to live through or around it, it does not, um, it does not work. And so it, it is, it, uh, it's more fear, uh, it's more, yeah, it's, it's, it's not better to, do, to try to, it's better to, to, to try to face it and to, um, to tell the stories. And you, um, at the beginning, you talked about truth speaking as a um, healing process. Um, I, I'm not, I, I don't think that it's easy to heal something, but at least we have to, um, yeah, to face the history and to 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 tell the stories, and um, because there is no other option. Thank you, thank you, all three of you. you just um, that is, that is So we have time to open it up um, with comments or questions um, from all of you doing very similar work.
I will steal two microphones sure. and give them to the audience. Absolutely. Again, it can be a question, it can be a reflection, it can be a comment. Can you hear me? If you feel more comfortable speaking or asking something in German, that's totally fine. I can translate that into English. You can speak the language. No, not French, because I can't translate. <laughs> uh, but you can uh, speak German. Each language is English. Hi, uh, Emma from Berlin, Kida. My question is to everyone who wants to answer that, please. I'm wondering nowadays that the role of uh, Remembrance Bird for, for present, of course it's obvious, we are doing it also for present, for changing our societies, but on the other hand, we are seeing a rise of fascism, far right, all kind of extremist ideologies, where did we fail? Where, what's, the, what's, what's the thing we are doing wrong that we are having more hate, although we are having more remembrance projects comparing to maybe 20 years ago? Of course, hate is always there. It's been always here. It will be here, but especially in Europe or in the States, we see also the rise of all kinds of hate. So we are doing something wrong. What's that? So I'll turn to you first, and if not, I'll turn to people out there because we're all in this, doing this work for the very reason you're talking about. Any, anyone want to address? I'll say, I, I, I think that um, human nature is such that this work is always going to be necessary. Uh, I think we should not believe that we're ever going to achieve a moment in time when we have resolved, um, we, we have uh, achieved our uh, goals universally in terms of establishing uh, truthful remembrance of the past and um, a, a world where society, where, where uh, justice is universal and racism is abolished completely. It is always going to be with us. I think what we have to do is be committed to creating an environment where our young people, especially, this is the, the work we do is important for all audiences. I think the work that we do for young people is what is essential in equipping young people to have the skills that they're going to need to continue this work into the future and to be committed to it. Um, I, that, for that reason, I, I think that uh, integrating this work into K-12 institutions and uh, reaching a point where there are requirements for time dedicated to history and civics in the classroom are absolutely essential if we want to be able to reach a point where we feel like we're making serious progress in this area. So I will um, provide an example from Brownsville. Um, when I mentioned that um, we didn't have any signage or any recognition of the Ku Klux Klan leader, uh, Rufus Bratton. So when we did put up a sign, um, there were vandals. And someone came and spray painted some uh, something over the over the sign, and we never had any vandalism at Brandsville ever until we put up that sign. So there are always going to be people who don't like what you do, and does that mean that you stop what you're doing? No, it means you do more of it. Other thoughts, questions? Yeah, right on. 
I don't think I don't think the question was do we continue to do what we do um, or stop what we're doing, but the question was a cause and effect question. Um, we see impact question. Impact question. I mean, we're seeing two phenomena at the same time. How are they related? Now, I, I don't know who it was on the podium spoke about spoke about the phenomenon of backlash, and I think that's where the cause and effect is. Is that part of what's happening is in reaction to our success? Uh, that's what I experienced in my work. The more successful we are, the more people are bothered by that success. You spoke about empowerment. It's not just we who are empowered by the debate, but our enemies are also empowered by where they stand. Now, um, why should only we be empowered in a debate? Because we feel we're right? Of course. Now the question is a question of the balance of power here. Okay, who is going to be stronger in the end? Um, we believe that we are going to carry the day, right? But it's a dialectical and not a linear relationship, which means that the more we push, the more we get, you know, back push. And now the question is where do we stand, you know, in the um, in the intersection between our dynamic and the counter dynamic? Well, that's the political question. It's a question of 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 macht. That's the German word power, right? empowerment. How strong are we, and how strong are the other narratives that are pushing back? Thank you. Other thoughts? So, uh, from the, con the context of someone that has been that has have done remembrance work in the states, <clears throat> I often wondered if the industry of community remembrance work was creating a barrier that locked people out of it. And uh, we've had growing inequality of wealth in our country and around the world over the last 30, 40 years. So it's possible for me to start a program, go find a philanthropist to fund it, get a steady stream of people to patronize it, then I can show numbers to my philanthropist and they give me more money. And now myself, my family, and my small network of volunteers and, and staff have a higher standard of living than the average person in our state. I don't think it's wrong for people to resent that if they, if they feel that uh, that same system has not afforded them an opportunity to have health care and education, rec access to recreation and things of that nature. But then I come here to Germany, and this is a country that provide, from what I understand, provides more access to healthcare, education at, at a minimum standard. And um, so I've wondered, well, in this country, I, you can't really, like, what is, I've been confused a little bit when I, when I look, but it was interesting because earlier today we were visiting with the students in a neighborhood that is very different than where we've been staying in our hotel. It's, it's more of a working class neighborhood. And when we were coming back, this was my first time seeing homes in Berlin that that looked almost like um, informal settlements or looked look very, very small. And that was the place where I saw a flag raised that I believe is, is, is the far right party here. And I don't know that that's I don't know that, that, that that's a coincidence. I think that when you have a large gap between those who have and those who have much less, people can fill that in with all kinds of information to justify or to, to help explain why they have, why they're experiencing something that's very you know, materially different. And if there are racialized, populist, anti-Semitic narratives that can help families understand that it's hard to combat that with remembrance if remembrance doesn't also include material provisions and things that help bring those people into the promise of democracy. That's been my theory, but here in Germany, you are providing material provisions and you still have the growth of populism. 
So it, it's, it's somewhat of a confusing question to see. So there's uh, Amy, do you want to? Okay. Um, I just want to build on the comments about backlash because it was heartbreaking to hear someone ask, like, are we doing this wrong? Because we need this room and the people in this room more desperately than ever in this moment. And I think it's so important to understand that, you know, my context is the states and the backlash, the rise of the far right and fascism in the states is specifically in response to the success that communities of color that others have experienced. It's quite literally at the core of the conspiracy theories and of the hate that we are seeing, you know, when, when neo Nazis say things like Jews will not replace us, it's about believing that black people and immigrants and refugees are taking over the country because they've seen success, because we have our first black president, because of these other indicators of progress. Um, and it's the same thing we're seeing now with the attacks on the LGBTQ community in the United States. And so, it's so easy to feel helpless in these moments, um, but the work that this room is doing feels more important than ever, and it's not because people are doing something wrong. We can all always course correct and improve our work to meet the moment, but it's not because we don't need what's happening in this room. We need it more than ever because of the backlash to the progress and to the success um, that we've seen. So I just wanted to sort of put a fine point on that in the context of what we're seeing in the states, and it's those same conspiracy theories that we're seeing on a global basis, I imagine here as well. Um, and I express my gratitude to this room because uh, no one is doing anything wrong if you're here. <laughs> okay, we're, we're gonna break, and I, <clears throat> um, but we will have time over dinner to be able to pick up these conversations, a lot of the questions that I posed at the beginning, we obviously couldn't cover them all, but I think that the three of you did uh, such a, a beautiful job of sort of from your own personal perspective in the work you're doing, raising a lot of those difficult questions about really the confrontation of narratives and what does it take. Um, so I, I really appreciate you and I appreciate, like Amy said, all the work people are doing in this room um, to keep things alive and democratic in our, our world. So, Lily, I'll hand it over to you. And yes, thank you, Mark. Hello, French voice. <laughs> yes? Sorry, I, th I don't think that people heard uh, what you were saying, um, and we want to include everyone in the room. So um, I'll just give you a, a microphone so uh, people can actually hear what they're saying. Uh, what do you mean when you use the term of success? Do you think people with this kind of room are more aware uh, about this kind of subject? Uh, so, uh, I said it was just a question for both of you. There is no thoughts beyond the question. <laughs> uh, I just specifically mean progress, right? Progress towards more equity, towards inclusion, towards diversity in the United States. And so that I think you know, the, the perfect example that so often comes up in these conversations is the fact that when the United States had its first black president, not long after we started seeing the rise of far right extremism on social media, increasingly seeping into our politics, culminating in a lot of the white supremacist attacks that we've seen in the United States in recent years. Um, it's much broader than that, but I think it's a concrete example of some of the, the progress. I imagine everyone in this room agrees is progress, but that uh, the reactionaries see as an example of, uh, of everything that's wrong with the country. Just, you want to end? It's, it's, it's of course difficult to measure success you know, in a statistical, statistically significant way. 
But one example I would give in terms of the work that we're doing is the incredible number of stumbling stones that have been laid first in Germany, then across all of Europe in the past 10 years. Something that started basically out of nowhere. And now you can walk German streets and you can see these small monuments to the victims. Now, that has created something with that and something with towns and cities because there are other narratives. And if you take the city that I come from in Leipzig, where the alluded to right-wing party is represented uh, in the city council, uh, they have introduced um, a petition or, or a motion um, that uh, uh, they would want stumbling stones also to be laid in front of the victims of allied bombing uh, um, of, um, of Leipzig. Okay, so that's a classic backlash thing, right? Um, who is the victim? Who, right? So, um, but it's a backlash to our success, right? Um, and I guess we're coming sort of from this optimistic sense of we're going to win this, we're kind of destined to win it because we're on the right side. That's not a bad position to start out uh, to, to pursue. I think we're stronger in, in all of this. Um, and um, uh, so, you know, the backlash is to be expected. Okay, you can. <clears throat> Okay, I, I, I understand that everybody really wants to get into this discussion and, um, and I think we need, uh, we need this discussion. Um, I, would, I would have one more uh, comment. I, Tamara, I think your hand, you wanted to say something. And then I would really ask um, you to forgive us for having to close this, even though it's uh, super interesting. And I hope that we can have um, some can continue some of these conversations at dinner. Like we do have an evening and almost everybody is coming. So Tamara, I will give you the microphone and then I think we can. Um... I can be real short. Most of the people said that I was gonna say, so I'm only saying what's left, right? <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity to, to add. I just wanted to go back because it was such a provocative question that, of course, we're still talking about. And I think that um, one of the things that this made me think about that you alluded to, but I don't think that we quite named it, is that correlation is not causation. And that's a fallacy of reasoning. And we really have to think very clearly right now and pay attention to our thinking and how we're thinking about what we put our attention on. Everything in this system right now wants to take our attention for some kind of purpose. And so what we do with our understanding of our own theory of change, which I'm so excited is the theme right now, also has to include our theory of resistance. Because every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. And so in order to be able to push back against that, we not only have to understand our own change theory, but also our theory around whatever resistance resistance cometh. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Tamara. Um, I think these are words that uh, that we need to hear. Um, and I think that in this room, um, we are able to see, like, we, we are able to, to talk about these things and we are able to be empowered by these thoughts and not to feel like we are pushed back. Um, and I, so thank you all for participating in this discussion and for for you for this uh, provocative question. I think it's... Uh... I did to provoke someone. It's facts, and I'm just trying to do our work. It's not a yeah. critique of what we do. No, 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 it's not a critique. And I think nobody, nobody, nobody... Information doesn't sound right to me. Okay, then, then it... Okay, I'm trying to, I'm trying to bring this to... Stimulating. Yes, a stimulating question. Thank you so much. I mean, what, uh, this is actually a great ending to an event when you feel like you should go on for uh, hours and hours. And I will um, shortly give the microphone to Joel Obermeyer. Just before that, so we know what happens after, um, I will say some logistical things. 
Um, and that is that we are walking to the restaurant. It's about 10 to 15 minutes away. And um, we have people here who guide you. Christine will guide you. Rahe uh, Ryan in the back will guide you. Um, Eleni in the green dress will guide you. And I will guide you. So you will get there safely. And so just before everything um, uh, gets messy. Joel, so, you want to say something? Actually, uh, I'll say something in a minute, but I wanted to make sure uh, we have one other question here. I know we don't have time to discuss it in depth, but I want to get it out there for people to think about. So, am I going to do that? Uh, yes, I have a question. Can I ask you a question? Yes, I have a question. 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 Yes, I have Nämlich möchte ich das hier in der Gruppe fragen, weil es sind halt hier Leute, die voll interessiert sind an diesen Themen und die sich auch dafür einsetzen. Und gerade in diesem Kontext würde es mich interessieren, was die Leute zu dem, was ich jetzt frage, denken. Nämlich, ähm, während sprechen wir halt oft über äh, die deutsche Geschichte, und über den Holocaust, und äh, wir erinnern an Sachen, die vergangen sind. Und gleichzeitig sehe ich halt, dass aktuell bei Umfragen die AfD 20% bekommt. Und in ihrem Wahlprogramm wird halt konkret angesprochen, dass ähm, es zu viele Muslime in Deutschland gibt. Und meine Frage ist halt, äh, wo seht ihr Muslime in all diesen Debatten. Wir werden, wird, darüber, wird, wird über Muslime gesprochen äh, oder eher weniger oder, oder spielt es vielleicht sogar sehr eine Rolle? Also ich, ich weiß es nicht. Ich will halt ein, das ist sehr eigennützig, die Frage. Ich würde halt gerne wissen, wieso das Bild bei euch ist. Das ist vielleicht Okay, Omar, Omar has a, Omar has a question. Aha, it was just turned off. <laughs> Um, Omar has a question to everybody who is involved in remembrance work um, and he is interested in your opinion or your answer to this question. He says that when we talk about remembrance work and remembering the Holocaust and then we can see in Germany the far-right party, the AfD, um, getting um, results of 20% of votes um, and when you look into their election uh, programs, you can see that um, they say we have too many Muslims um, in Germany. And so he is wondering what, what role um, do Muslims play in this whole discussion? Um, what do you think or what role does it play in your work? I hope that's mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And that's that's a question for everybody. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm I'm really sorry that I have to be the the devil here, um, but the restaurant will literally um, probably not feed us um, if we don't get there at some point. And I think this question is so interesting, but it's a complete like it's a new topic, and I. Hope, I really hope that you can talk about these questions um, at dinner. We will have an informal reception where we can talk to each other, we can move around. I really want you to take these thoughts and, and continue the conversation on that. Okay? So, um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much.